glad you're here today. I wondered, have, have any of you, or do you know what I'm talking about when I reference the concept of like a church revival? Now, these are all but extinct. You don't really see them anymore. But the basic idea is that you bring in a guest speaker and it's supposed to be somebody that can rally the troops and you schedule this thing for a whole week. And back in the day, they used to be even longer. And then every single night, you uh, everybody comes to church and every night the speaker preaches his heart out and at the end he offers an invitation to try to get people to respond as they you know sing the invitation song so this is something we don't see a lot anymore but it's something that has been part of certainly american church history for many years now why go to all this trouble um and i think the the rationale is that christians and we've all maybe experienced this over time can kind of fall into a slump our faith sort of goes on autopilot a little bit. Discipleship gets backburnered because it just seems like there's so many other pressing things vying for our attention in life. And a revival is intended to be a spiritual um, defibrillator, kind of the dead back to life sort of thing. So two questions. One, how many of you have ever been to a revival? Now, you can't raise your hands or shout at the screen, but maybe answer in the room there if you've got somebody nearby. Tell them if you've ever been to a revival. And here's the money question. How many of you have ever gone forward during a revival at the end of a sermon? Especially bonus points if you went forward during Just As I Am. Especially if you waited till like stanza number six or seven of Just As I Am. When I was probably 19 years old, I was attending a church that was hosting a revival. And this isn't the type of church that it was optional whether or not you went. You just went. It just everybody <laughs> had to go. It was about 50 people in the congregation, and we were all there every night. You'd sing, you'd have the speaker, you know, and he'd offer an invitation. I think it was probably the last night the speaker really zeroed in on some of the young guys in the audience, including me. And he has this impassioned speech about how we really need to give our lives to preaching. How, and, and it's just, I don't know if you can describe the feeling unless you're sitting there in the room, you know, where the speaker has really stirred you up. And, and the spirit is working and there's this mixture of guilt and repentance and conviction and excitement. And myself and a handful of other young guys went forward during the uh, song and uh, dedicated our lives to preaching. So... Long story short, here I am. Now, there were some left turns along the way, but it was at a revival. Side note, actually, if you grew up in a Church of Christ or a Christian church, or if the label Restoration Movement means anything to you, then you can actually trace your spiritual lineage back to one specific historic revival that took place in Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801. Uh, I have a picture of the building and, uh, and then, you know, an artist's rendition, uh, rendering of the crowd. Uh, but this thing is in the history books. They, they claim that more than 20,000 people showed up over the course of a week. This tiny little church building, so obviously they kind of had to take this thing outside. And, of course, you couldn't have, like, one speaker shouting loud enough without amplification to make themselves heard for everybody. So they had makeshift stages all over the forest. There would be guys on these stages. There would be guys standing on tree trunks preaching. It was like a, a music festival, the Coachella uh, of revivals. And, and the deal is God was up to something that, that this sparked of movement and you are sitting in your living room 219 years later as a result of something that happened in a revival. Now we're starting a new series called Revival and we cannot get together every day. Let me tell you, I wish we could. We could not hear guys preaching from street, uh, tree stumps. I mean, I guess we actually could, but Probably wouldn't be the quality preaching we're looking for. We can't be in the same room, but God is doing something right now. Um, and maybe you can kind of admit that your faith has been on life support a little bit. Maybe you feel like you've been operating on autopilot. Maybe the last five weeks have been a bit of a wake-up call about how busy and distracted your life has gotten. And God is calling you to revival. Now, your instinct may be to kind of hunker down, ride this thing out, but that is not what God is calling you to. No matter who you are, no matter where you're listening to this, God is calling, he has plans. He's calling to you for 
revival. I think that's what God is working on. I think he's certainly working on it in our country, but I know he's working on it in our church. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to dig into two chapters in the book of Revelation. Uh, These two chapters are fascinating because they contain seven letters to seven churches that were facing this existential threat. Now, the author, John, loves the number seven. He used it all through his gospel. He uses it in the book of Revelation quite a bit. Uh, He loves it. So he picked these seven churches, but they're kind of indicative of every church everywhere. The same things that he addresses in these letters uh, threaten all of us. It's things like apathy and sin and discouragement and false teaching. And so what these actually are, they are John writing down what Jesus had said to these seven churches. And it's so amazing to hear. And of course, we need to read what are Jesus' words to these churches. Now, the book of Revelation is a little bit like going exploring in the jungle. Uh, If you don't know what you're doing, you can get in real trouble. So there are two rules that you need to keep uh, in your back pocket to kind of keep you safe at all times. Number one, Revelation is all intertwined and wrapped up in the Old Testament. Uh, To paraphrase Winston Churchill, Revelation is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. It's this wild imagery and, you know, the, the, the beast and dragons. So you can really get speculative. You can look at headlines and you can kind of like pull things together that probably shouldn't be pulled together. Um, and seriously, some folks are having a field day with the coronavirus and the book of Revelation. There are YouTube videos going up like crazy, a lot of tinfoil hat type things going on right now. So Revelation can really get you in trouble unless you realize that the theological language of the first century church was the Old Testament. And so John, well, Jesus, through John, is drawing these references from books like Ezekiel and Isaiah, and he's remixing them and creating new understanding and meaning. But it was a language that the people were familiar with. Second rule that you need to keep in mind as we read uh, these two chapters in the book of Revelation is that Jesus' words are going to sound harsh. But They are loving. Now, Jesus has something to say. Uh, It's been about 60 years since the ascension. Uh, The churches have had this opportunity to, you know, kind of run the course of, of good and bad. And there's some stuff going on in these churches that is not good. And Jesus has something to tell them. He's warning them. And so this is life and death stuff. So the stuff that Jesus says is going to sound harsh to our modern ears. It really just does. But Jesus isn't all about positive affirmation. He's got some hard things to say because the church is on life support, and it needs to wake back up. It needs to be revived. At the end of these letters in Revelation 3.19 is this phrase that I think is, is key to our understanding of what Jesus is doing. Those I love, I rebuke and discipline. So I want you to understand that as you read the book of Revelation, Jesus has both higher expectations and more grace for us than we do for ourselves. All right, let's dig in. Letter number one, Revelation chapter two and verse one. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Right from the beginning, angels, stars, lampstands. Yes, It's all Old Testament and imagery. Just for a second, think about the golden lampstands. Now, you would have to know to understand this imagery that Jesus is making reference to the menorah that was in the temple, the golden menorah, the temple which represented the presence of God. So it was this thing that people would understand that this, oh, this is something that is referencing where God is. And just like God was present in the temple, Jesus is present in the churches. And, and so you kind of like, you read that, and you're like, okay, but why doesn't the book of Revelation just say what it means? Why all the veiled language? Why all the imagery? Well, the other day, uh, Corrine was scrolling through her news app on her phone. It's, of course, aggregates, all these different headlines, these different news sources. Um, and I want to, she shared with me this headline, and I wanted to share it with you. Now, I want you to understand, this headline was written in English in the year of our Lord, 2020. Now, I have to apologize in advance because this is the first and hopefully last time that these words will ever be read in a sermon. Here is the headline from, of course, the always reliable TMZ. 
I'm almost embarrassed even to read it. <laughs> Diddy hosts star-studded IG dance-a-thon, reunites with J-Lo and A-Rod. Now, she read that to me, and I said, I mean, I recognize all those sounds, but what is that? Listen, to understand that headline, you, as an American, would have to have a sense of popular culture, you would have to also know some social media slang. You would have to have a basic grasp of English idioms. And then you would have to have kind of a general grasp of some sports knowledge. Now, I'm not going to bother interpreting uh, because literally anything you could do with your time is uh, a better use. But this can feel exactly like reading the book of Revelation for us because there's this whole wealth of knowledge that people would bring to it. So you'd need to understand Hebrew culture and Old Testament language and Old Testament laws and rituals. So just remember that as you read it, you're reading into somebody else's idioms and vernacular and slang. So when we read Revelation chapter 2 verse 1, Jesus is among the churches. He says, I'm with you. And he starts off with a few positives. Look at verse 2 and 3. Jesus says to this, to this church at Ephesus, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that have and you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. All right. So far, so good. And I've thought about how you could kind of summarize the uh, Ephesian church in these two verses. And so far, things are good. They have the right deeds, the right doctrine, and the right determination. They've got deeds, doctrine, and determination. Now, the city of Ephesus, is. this is kind of important to know. Again, context. It, wa it ha held one of the seven wonders of the world. It was the Temple of Artemis. And I have this picture here, and you can imagine this would have been a cool thing uh, to go see, to go visit. Yeah, you would fly to go see something like this. And it was totally a tourist attraction. It was like the Statue of Liberty or the Golden Gate Bridge. And you could actually go there and buy overpriced replicas of the uh, temple and, of course, of the goddess Artemis. And there's this whole story in the book of Acts chapter 19. And honestly, you should read it because it's how crazy. Christianity threatened the tourist industry there. It's fascinating, and you should uh, check that out. So um, Ephesus was all about this temple. So it's not just tourism, but it's also worship. So think about this. The economy, the social life, and the religious life of this city all centered around this temple. And as you can imagine, that created some tricky situations for Christians. It was a little difficult to navigate, like buying and selling and interacting socially with everybody because everything centered around worship and um, the economy of this temple. So you would lose business, you'd lose friendships, you'd lose opportunities because of this. And Jesus comes to Ephesus or comes to the people of Ephesus and he says, hey, good job. You're holding steady. Your deeds are good. Your doctrine's good. Your determination's good. That's awesome. These were good, solid Christians in this sense. Now, every brand of Christendom has its um, insider language, secret signals, so to speak. Now, speaking broadly, um, Churches of Christ, not necessarily Woodbury, but Churches of Christ broadly. If, in fact, if you have somebody sitting in the room that grew up in the Churches of Christ, they may know, and you may have to pause and ask them for a little bit of uh, background about this. Or maybe you can just email me if you need to. So hardcore insiders might know this. They might know that there is a difference between when they read uh, upper and lowercase c in church of Church of Christ. They may know that. They may recognize, oh, they, they, there's an uppercase c and it's there for a reason. You should ask them. Hardcore insiders might recognize the name Keith Lancaster. If you grew up or if you're an insider of the Church of Christ, you might recognize the phrase or even have used the phrase command, principle, or necessary inference. Those are all things that are kind of unique to the Church of Christ. They're, they're, they're ways that we can kind of signal to one another that we've got this figured out. And I could go on and on and on. For example, it's revelation, not revelations, right? That's always a fun way to show somebody that you're a know-it-all. So don't feel bad if 
all those things went over your head. In fact, insider language and culture is often more of a hurdle than a help because Christians can slip into these bad habits of creating identity markers as shortcuts, and that way they can just look around and spot the other insiders, who has the right deeds, who has the right doctrine, who has the right determination. So Jesus does compliment them. They're holding strong, but Revelation chapter 2 Verse 4, and this verse may be familiar to many of you. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Now, I think this contrast that Jesus has created in these two verses is, is incredibly important. First of all, you have these good things in the pro column. You have their deeds and their doctrine and their determination. Those are good things. Yet, this one negative undermines all of that. Now, we could uh, talk for a little bit about what is the love that you had at first? What is this forsaken love? Is it love for God? Love for people? Is it general excitement and passion about Christianity? It kind of doesn't matter because all of that is sort of one big ball of wax. If you've been doing the first John readings along with us at church, then you know that John is very clear. You cannot separate love from God from love from people. They're, they're all combined into one thing. Now, I've mentioned this a number of times. It's a great source of uh, sermon illustrations, but our family spent a number of years uh, as missionaries in Taiwan. My parents uh, were missionaries, and us kids were tagging along. Um, we were there for about seven years. I came back one year prior to everybody else after I had graduated high school. Now, one of the things about doing mission work that maybe you just don't think about all the time is that, uh, and this is true at least 30 years ago. Who knows if it's exactly true today? You don't realize all the foods that you crave because you can't get them. Like you can't get peanut butter, you can't get Kool-Aid, things you take for granted. The whole food production uh, and distribution system is totally different. So back, at least back in the early 90s, there, were, there was not a lot of uh, Mexican food in Southeast Asia. No tacos, no refried beans, no tamales, none of that. So you'd start developing these obsessions with flavors that you simply couldn't get. So I remember uh, one day, and I called my mom this week to try to confirm these details with her, uh, our family decided to try to make taco salad. You know, a little taste of home, just what things uh, were like, used to be like. Now, immediately you begin to run into a few problems. Um, first of all, you can't get cheese. My mom had been able to go to this specialty market and special order cheese that had been shipped in. So we had cheese, got that taken care of. Beef is extremely expensive, uh, and it's totally out of our price range. But you can substitute ground pork, so okay, that's, that's there. Also, there is no lettuce in Taiwan. There's, it's just not a thing. There is cabbage, and it's kind of like lettuce, sort of green leafy vegetable. They did have tomatoes and onions, um, but <laughs> crucially, very fundamentally, there is no such thing as tortilla chips anywhere, but lots of rice. Oh, and no sour cream, but you could get mayonnaise, so, which is also white. So think about this. At some point along the way, with enough substitutions, whatever this is, it is no longer taco salad. You cannot add enough cabbage to make up for the lack of lettuce. You cannot add enough mayo, which I don't like anyway, to make up for a lack of sour cream, which I also don't like. This is not taco salad. It is not even taco salad adjacent. It's inspired by the faint memory of a, something that used to be taco salad, but it is not taco salad. Jesus contrasts their good, verses 2 and 3, with their lack of love, verse 4. And the truth is, there are not enough good deeds in the world to substitute for a lack of love. There's not enough doctrine to substitute for a lack of love. There's not enough determination to substitute for a lack of love. And at some point, without love, this is no longer Christianity. And that's Jesus' point in this letter. You have left your first love. And Revelation verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, If you do not repent, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. You will no longer be in the presence of Christ. That is heavy. But Jesus, I have got my good works down to a science. I know exactly what to do. It's not the point. Jesus, I have got doctrine totally squared away. I know book, chapter, and verse. No deal. 
Jesus, I work hard. I'm focused. I'm determined. I can't help you. Now, I know why we focus on deeds and doctrine and determination to the neglect of love. It is way easier to focus on those things than it is to focus on love. For those of us that like to have really clear expectations, you can make lists of doctrine and deeds. And, and honestly, let's, when you're talking about looking at other people, it's easier to judge people if you've got this clear list that you can hold them accountable to, whether or not they realize it. But love is hard. There's not a clear script. For example, in non-COVID-19 times, love might look like being with people, hugging on people, shaking hands, encouraging people, close proximity, no personal space. In COVID-19 times, love looks like keeping your distance and wearing a mask when you're in public. Even if you think this is overblown, that is still expressing love. Love is hard because it adapts to the situation at hand. Sometimes love uh, overlooks an offense. Sometimes love confronts. Matthew chapter 18 records this conversation between Peter and Jesus. And Peter sort of brings this up out of the blue. Uh, evidently, it's starting to dawn on Peter how much Jesus is asking of his followers. And I think Peter is looking for the limits of the love, the hard edges. Where do I get off the bus? Where's the off-ramp? And so he comes up to Jesus, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And then he offers this suggestion, up to seven times. Now, Peter thinks he way overshot the number because, I mean, imagine this. Even now, even you, imagine you knew someone that had betrayed you once. Do you think you'd really give them a second chance? Unlikely. But even if you dug deep into the well of your generosity of grace and you said, maybe I'll give them a second chance, you think you would give them a third? No way. Seven seems like an incredible amount. We wouldn't give them a third or fourth or fifth chance. Seven is way too many. And Jesus says, listen, Peter, you are not even close Verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Move a decimal point, Peter. You're going to have to get out a calculator to love people to the depth that I'm calling you to. Love is hard. Now, uh, just a quick side note, and I think this is important, and I think this is important, and I'm just, I'm talking to our church, so if you don't go to the Woodbury Church of Christ, tune out for a second. That's totally fine. I think Jesus contrasts deeds and doctrine with love because I think it's easy to be unloving toward people we disagree with. I, I want you to just think about the people you know because Woodbury is a pretty big theologically diverse place. Think about the people you know that um, think about Christianity differently than you do. These aren't fun labels, but just imagine people that you consider too conservative or people that you consider too liberal or too progressive or too fundamental. Because of our beliefs, we can actually feel justified in being dismissive and unloving toward people who disagree with us. Honestly, it is so much easier to find a group of people who share our religious sensibilities and just hang out with them, it makes for a fun little echo chamber where our beliefs are never challenged. So I challenge you, church, family, seek out and spend socially appropriate distance time with people that you know you disagree with. Talk with them. Work with them. Love on them. Our, our religious differences should be a sign that we meet, need to move closer, not farther apart. All right, back, back to the regularly programmed sermon. Jesus said love is the greatest command. Paul said if you don't have love, you're just annoying. Really. Uh, the Beatles said all you need is love. And they weren't completely right, but they were pretty close. It's deeds and doctrine and determination, but mostly love. Listen, discipleship without love will either become lifeless or it will become toxic. I have seen both. I have lived both. And it is a mess. Discipleship, lived in love, is life-giving, and it's exciting. With this uh, lockdown, some of you are doing awesome. Some of you are loving your neighbors, loving your friends, loving your family. You're doing grocery runs. You're giving more generously. You're encouraging. You are discipling at home, and it is awesome. You are a life-giving presence. There are people in our church who are killing it. They're honestly 
I mean, it puts me to shame. I'm so impressed. I'm so proud to call you brothers and sisters. Some of us are discovering that our capacity to love <laughs> wasn't all that great. We ran out of forgiveness and patience when the toilet paper disappeared. Our discipleship was mostly built on deed and doctrine and were dangerously low on love. So what does Jesus say in response to all of this? Revelation chapter 5, the, uh, uh, the second half, re repent and do the things you did at first. Repent. Trace your way back to where you left the trail and get back on. Now, just a word about repentance, and it is going to come up a lot in these uh, two chapters in the book of Revelation. I think this is so important, so if, if you can write this down or type this on the notes app on your phone or whatever you need to do, successful discipleship has never been about perfection. Successful discipleship has always been about repentance. And the great thing about repentance is that we don't need to organize a church revival. We don't need to have you here every night. We don't need to get some fantastic charismatic speaker uh, to preach at you and then to sing just as I am. Because you can pause this video right now and you can have a conversation with God. We're praying for that. We as a staff have been praying that the Spirit would work in you and would transform your heart. You can talk with your spouse and your kids, and you can apologize for some of the ways that you've behaved <laughs> during this lockdown. Maybe they've seen behavior and actions and words from you that you're not proud of. You can pick up a phone, and you can work on a broken relationship. You can repent right from your living room. You can be a disciple at home. Uh, church, I think this is true, and I know it probably goes without saying, but we need a revival of love we need to feel guilty when we operate out of selfishness. We need to feel sad about the people that we have disagreed with and distanced ourselves from. Listen, this is so important. A church without love is not a church of Christ. Big C or little c. Because that's not what Christ is about. A disciple that doesn't love is a taco salad without any of the things that make it a taco salad. So, as we disciple at home, let's revive our first love. God has pushed the pause button on the world, and he is giving you an opportunity to reconfigure your life, to rethink what it's all about, to let the Spirit grab your heart and transform you, to revive it, repent, and do the things that you did at first. Well, this is just week one of our journey of revival. There's so much more to talk about. I am incredibly excited uh, to dig through these two chapters of Revelation. You can cheat if you want and read a little bit ahead, but I invite you to come back next week. Steve, our discipleship minister, is going to share about what Jesus had to say to the next two churches, and I know you're going to want to hear it. So thank you for paying attention. We're going to pray, and then we're going to go about our day, but I pray that your day is filled with love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful um, to be able to stop and pause and to think about this church that was so, uh, so good in so many ways but lacked this necessary ingredient to be who you are truly calling them to be. God, help us to be self-reflective and thoughtful and dig into our own lives and to ask ourselves some tough questions. Lord, we know that love is the, is the greatest of all virtues that you've called us to live out. And so, Lord, help us not neglect that. If we've fallen short, may we repent and may we climb back up to this place of loving people, uh, loving people we disagree with, loving people we're different from. Lord, I pray that this, this pause in our world would be an opportunity to revive our love. Lord, bring us back to revival. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day.